The UK faces sober years as the country's finance minister announced the biggest budget cuts in decades. But could these tough measures save the country's economy? And what are the political ramifications? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hul Abdel Hamid. They began with pumping money into the system. Now they're cutting back and cutting back drastically. On Wednesday, UK's finance minister, George Osborne, announced the biggest budget cut since World War II. He's proposed an extensive list of austerity measures for the next four years. Here are just some of them. Most government departments will face an average cut of 19%. Up to 500,000 public sector jobs will be gone in the next four to five years. Defense budget will be cut by 8%, axing over 40,000 jobs by 2015. Child benefit payments to higher rate taxpayers will be stopped. And welfare and pension reforms are also in the pipeline. With the help of these measures, the British government hopes to save as much as $130 billion. Osborne seemed convinced that this was the only way forward. To back down now and abandon our plans would be the road to economic ruin. Yeah. We will stick to the course, we will secure our country's stability, we will not take Britain back to the brink of bankruptcy. Yeah. Well, joining our discussion today are our guests all in London. Vanessa Rossi, Senior Research Fellow of the International Economics Programme at Chatham House and political commentator and author Ian Dale. And finally, the New Statesman senior political editor Mehdi Hassan. Welcome to the program. Vanessa Ross Rossi, let me start with you. I mean, after months of warning, the austerity plan is finally, those spending reviews finally uh, detailed. It sounds like a big squeeze, really. Yes, but I don't think there were too many shocks in this. Uh, there's odd little parts of the programme that maybe were something of a surprise, but the overall numbers and the scale of the cuts uh, actually doesn't seem at the worst end of expectations. That might sound strange when they're such big numbers, but we'd had such a strong build-up in recent months about the potential for cuts that I don't think anyone would be too surprised. And even for next year, the planned cuts in the immediate first year are not as big as we feared they might be. Well, Ian Dale, um, George Osborne was actually being quite alarmist. He said that this was the only way of bringing back the UK economy uh, from the brink. Was he a bit exaggerating there? No, I don't think he was at all, because I think if we had continued spending in the way that the previous government did under Gordon Brown, we would have gone over that precipice and the international money markets would have lost confidence in the British economy, interest rates would have gone up, there would have been far more business bankruptcies. So I think George Osborne has done the only thing possible. Now, actually, what he's done is reduce government spending. It sounds drastic when you say cuts of 19%, but actually it's only going back to the levels that the last government was spending in 2006 it is cuts of about 80 billion pounds and, and that's obviously a lot of money and it will hurt no one's pretending that it won't hurt there will be job losses in the private sector in, in the public sector and the challenge now is for the private sector to grow and take up uh, those in, those jobs which will be lost in the public sector well Mehdi Hassan I mean how realistic is this challenge to uh, to expect the uh, private sector to absorb about half a million jobs Jobs. Well, it's not realistic at all. The government's projections for private sector job growth over the next few years exceed those uh, of what we saw during the boom years. The government is expecting the private sector to hire more people than it did uh, between 2000 and 2008, which is just uh, laughable. And it's disappointing to hear Ian uh, repeat propaganda basically of the Tory party to say that spending levels are just going back to 2006 of course that's a nonsensical comparison because in 2006 our GDP was totally different it's not a like-for-like -like comparison as most respected economists have pointed out and just to pick up on what Vanessa said I mean talking about expectations is interesting because of course they have laid the groundwork for these cuts they were alarmist about the idea of us losing our credit rating etc George Osborne did talk about 40% departmental cuts knowing full well that that was never going to be announced so that when he announced 
announced 19%, we all say, oh, that's wonderful. It's not 40%, but of course, 19%, as you said at the start of the program, is still unprecedented. We've not had cuts like this in Britain since the 1920s. And my worry is, not only will these cuts impact, as the Treasury's own figures show, disproportionately on the poorest members of society, it could send our economy, as many economists, including our latest Nobel Prize winning economist, Christopher Pissarides here in Britain have warned, back into a double dip recession next year. That's the great worry. Well, um, these fears of a double dip recession, uh, Vanessa Rossi, are these, are these also sort of alarmi alarmist bells from the opposition, or there's all, that's a reality that must be taken into account now? Yes, and of course, what finally happens next year uh, depends partly on what the rest of the world does. One of the difficulties at the moment is that the UK is undertaking this tightening at the same time as there are signs of some weakening uh, potentially in other countries too, and partly because of fiscal measures also having to be taken in our neighbouring countries in Europe. So I, I think the concerns are wider spread than just the UK. In fact, the UK may not be in the worst position here, uh, but certainly it makes it much more difficult to overcome what next year will probably be around 5% cut in the overall budget, the first stage of this programme of cuts, the average being five. We'd really need to see private sector growth in the two to two and a half percent range if we're going to stand any chance at all of the private sector being able to sustain some of the jobs that might be, less, that might be lost in the public sector. So that's quite a tall order to manage all of those things all at the same time. I think it's not completely pessimistic, but certainly it's quite a challenge. Well, Ian Day, uh, Vanessa was just talking about other European countries uh, just across the channel in France people are demonstrating and the countries are at a standstill because of the rising age of retirement now George Osborne announced similar measures today how do you think are the unions of the public sector going <laughs> to react to this well, I think we in Britain look at what's happening in France with a wry smile. They want to put their retirement age up from 60 to 62. Um, ours is going out to 67 or 68. And there haven't been riots on the street in this country. I, I think the French have a tradition of uh, a fairly violent reaction to uh, any public sector reform. Um, we don't in this country. Yesterday, outside Parliament, there was a demonstration of about two or 3,000 people. It was all very well behaved. There were no cars set alight, nothing like that. Then they all off to a conference centre and listen to some speeches. That's what happens in this country. I'm not ruling out that there might well be some very big public sector strikes over the next couple of years, but they won't save a single job. In fact, what they will do is actually threaten many more jobs. So I hope the trade unions actually try uh, and work with the government to, to try and ameliorate the effect of some of these cuts. But no one's pretending that it's not going to be painful for a lot of people. Well, actually, Mehdi Hassan and Ed Miliband said that it was the biggest gamble with people's jobs and it could entail further loss of jobs. Well, the, George Osborne uh, kind of sped through the part of his statement where he confirmed what we found out yesterday uh, thanks to a long lens uh, on a document in public, and that is that 490,000 jobs uh, at a minimum are expected to be lost according to the government's own Office for Budget Responsibility over four years. That's a massive number of people, and that's just in the public sector. Earlier this month, we had a report from PricewaterhouseCoopers which predicted a million job losses across both public and private sectors. They predicted half a million private sector job losses because so many private firms, of course, depend on government contracts uh, depend on the economy ticking along and not going either back into a double dip or even sluggish growth of around 1% or less. So the job front is very, very worrying. You know, the last time the Conservatives were in office, in the early 1990s, we had a Chancellor of the Exchequer who said that unemployment was a price <coughs> worth paying for lower inflation. We now have a chance who would never dare utter such, uh, such cold-hearted words in public, but the policies are the same. For the, the price of deficit reduction for this government of Conservatives and Liberal Democrats is higher unemployment, and it's a price they're willing to pay. It's also a price that could lead to a wider budget deficit. That's what we saw in the 1980s. When unemployment gets higher, the deficit actually gets bigger because you have to pay all those redundancy costs. You have to pay all those unemployment benefits and income support. And the deficit actually gets bigger. That's the irony of what might happen in the coming years. Well, Vanessa Rossi, isn't it also a case that uh, the government had a real a free sailing here? I mean, the opposition, the Labour Party, did uh, cry, uh, did oppose some of the parts of this plan, but they didn't put anything else on the table. So what, was there any other solution? I think in spite of all the worries about the effects, 
most people recognise that there will have to be some reining in of the overall debt levels. Debt has increased quite sharply and if it went on that way uh, then it would not become supportable and we could see quite violent reactions in markets that we wouldn't be able to cope with the payments and so forth. So there had to be something done and in my reckoning as well it's a question of having to be prudent. In two or three years time we don't know what the global economy is going to be like, we don't know what shocks could come along and the government has to be prepared to be able to help the economy if there were to be some other untoward events in a few years time. If they don't rein in the budget now they'll have no firepower left in the case that we do have any other problems ahead. That's not a prudent thing to do. So we really have no alternative and the debate really then is about the scale of these cuts. It's the scale of the cuts and the speed of the cuts. Can we find time for the private sector to react? Now the Price Waterhouse Coopers I would say is quite an extreme negative scenario. On the more positive side it's possible that the private sector job generation could about offset these cuts of about the 500,000 that have been highlighted. That's the other end of the spectrum. That's still not great news, but it's better than the other one. We should remember as well that the public sector has actually increased the number of jobs from a low point just over 10 years ago of just over 5 million jobs to 6 million today. That's a big increase in public sector jobs, most of them in a very short period of time. And quite frankly, a lot of this increase is not supportable in circumstances where we have to pay our way and we have to find ways of reducing down the debt. So understandable as all these problems are, somewhere along the line the changes have to be there and the Labour Party knows it as well. Well, Matty Hassan, you seem to be disagreeing with what Vanessa is saying. Well, <laughs> well, well, two things in response to Vanessa. One is that uh, uh, you, you say that there might be problems down the line and they need some firepower. I'm saying, what if these cuts themselves, as many eminent economists suggest, actually cause those problems down the line? And the other point, this idea that the Labour Party has no alternative is just absurd. Uh, we had Labour leadership candidates over the summer, like well, Ed Bulls laying out alternatives. We have... The we have Shadow Ch the Shadow Chancellor gave a speech on Monday in which he pointed out you could take seven and a half billion pounds from the banks. Interestingly, the Chancellor today said he would be taking much more from the banks than he had previously announced. So th there's, a, there's one th part of this discussion that we're not mentioning. You can reduce a deficit by spending cuts, or you can also do it with tax rises. Sweden, which, cut the, which balanced its books in the 90s, and which the Conservatives often point to as their model scenario, did it 50% through spending cuts and 50% through tax rises. This coalition, for ideological reasons, wants to do it three quarters with spending cuts and only a quarter with tax rises. They let the bankers and the rich members of society off. The Treasury's own tables today show that the only way that the rich can uh, pay more is through Labour's tax changes, Labour's 50p tax. This coalition is not interested in taxing the, the banks more. We'll see tomorrow what's announced on Thursday, the uh, Chancellor says. But so far, they want to squeeze the welfare budget. Another £7 billion well, pounds taken from the welfare budget well, to pay for the bankers' crisis. Well, but I remember just that we had very... We had a very similar programme to Sweden's ourselves in the 1990s. Quite a number of countries did. Sweden was quite extraordinary about the changes they implemented, but the UK also did. And it was through a mixture of both spending cuts or freezes and taxation increases at that time. And we can successfully do it. Uh, I think that it's quite right to argue about the particular points of what is cut or what is increased for taxes. What I'm suggesting is that overall, whichever political party you're from, there has to be a pretty broad agreement that those levels of debt cannot continue to rise and so the arguments are very specifically about the policies which policies and not about the general direction of the budget but and there's the a debt. big difference between I just want to bring Ian Dale in the conversation uh, in, and just also move on to other sectors that have been uh, that will face uh, cuts like the military up to 8% and the foreign office up to 24% surely that will have an impact on Britain's operations overseas on Britain's relations with the rest of the world, won't it? Well, of course it will, and nobody's denying that it won't. But can I just react to what Mehdi was saying? Because he's becoming increasingly delusional in this conversation. He's acting as if the Labour Party hadn't been in power for 13 years. If they'd wanted to uh, tax the bankers more, why didn't they? At the end of every Labour well, government, 
unemployment has been higher than at the beginning. Labour has failed to oh, reduce no. unemployment in ev every single time it's been in power. So, so to suggest well, that on. the Conservatives are s somehow sort of wickedly trying to, to cut because they, have, because they want to do it is just, no, no. just ridiculous. The they have been left this here. legacy. Ian. They have been left this legacy Ian. by the Labour Party of huge debt, more than we've no, ever had in our country, more than we had the at the end of the pass. Second World War. I know the Conservative no, Party wants to give the bankers, give the bankers a pass. A pass. There's the bankers who words into my mouth. Not the Labour Party. Don't put words into my mouth. When you listen to both Ian Dale yeah. and Mehdi Hassan, it seems there's a lot of politics uh, involved into this conversation. So I just wanted to know from you, how much of politics is part of this plan in the sense that it, it seems that it's All a plan it. that will take the coalition government to the 2015 elections? Well, I'm sorry, if, if I, I frankly conser, don't think you can say all of it one way or the other. There's one or two relatively mean little items in here, which I think I myself would quibble with too. There's the issue of things like legal aid and there's the issue of freezing the BBC TV licences, for example, which don't seem to have any place in here except somebody's hobby horse, probably. But if you look at the general realm of it, the, the, the general direction of this policy, I really do think that it's hard to disagree with the overall thrust of it. That's why you have a coalition government more or less behind it and I think that we have to go along with the view that you can't have public sector finances running out of order this is a very important point to consolidate on for the rest of the world's opinion and whether you like it or not financial services businesses are quite an important part of the UK's overall business plan the overall business we do abroad and the overall standing of the UK in markets and so forth so we can't ignore all those factors and there isn't great magic really pots annoying. of taxation that we can suddenly find and solve all those other problems so we have to have a balanced program whether well, it should be 50 50 whether write, it should be 75 25 to, is a different well, issue. Vanessa was just talking about the rest of the world so let's see what US President Barack Obama had to say last June he warned against cutting national debts too quickly he said in the past stimulus was too quickly withdrawn and resulted in renewed hardships and recessions he also said that in Europe the case for stimulating economic recovery using the public finances has been overtaken by concerns about stabilizing government debt. So it seems here that really David Cameron and o Obama don't see eye to eye uh, about this whole issue of economic recovery, e well, Ian Dale. The IMF and the OECD and the European Union have all endorsed the coalition government's economic plans. Now, frankly, I'd rather take notice of them than I would Barack Obama, who's facing his own economic problems. Mahdi Hassan, you seem to be nodding all the time in disagreement. What are well, you, you not know, agreeing look, well, with on, on, on now? Well, Ian's, Ian's right. He has listed those organisations. Ian's right. But, of course, the IMF are all over the place. Uh, in September, they said we shouldn't cut too quickly because it would undermine the recovery. Then they sent a team to Britain and said, actually, we do support the plan. And then they said, wait a minute, everyone shouldn't cut together. So the IMF is slightly all over the place. They've also criticised the coalition for having a rather small levy on the banks. They want it to be triple the size. So let's see what George Osborne announces tomorrow. Look, the point is, there are two sides to this economic economic debate. No one denies that. Vanessa seems to be implying there's only one that we have to go with this coalition strategy. No, we all agree the deficit has to come down, but do we have to eliminate the whole deficit, the whole structural deficit over four years, over this arbitrary well, political timetable, in, in time for a 2015 was, general election? Much, Sorry, I was frankly much more worried about what would happen next economy? year. Next what? year is much more critical. Over a whole period of five years, there's a lot of other things that can happen. What was really critical was that this coalition government didn't go for extraordinarily big cuts in the next year, over 2011 and 2012. That could have, I frankly also think, could have been disastrous. It's too much too quickly. Actually, the signs are that it's going to be relatively steadily phased in, and that makes me a little less nervous. But Barack Obama, I don't know where he got I mean, his figures from. I, I, I'm sure not right that every one of these... Uh, uh, post-recession tightenings leads to a new double dip isn't true. Uh, so I, I think he's he's really talking his own book no, to a large extent here. And we also know that the finger, well, Medi, the finger in Europe, the out. finger in Europe Medi is, is being pointed at Germany. The finger in Europe is not being pointed at the UK. Well, Ian Day, it's Germany Medi is that's getting to the make problem. Out. Ian Day, George Osborne detailed for a uh, very uh, longly uh, where all the cuts will be. Uh, he also said how he, he was showed how he will carry the country up to 2014 and into the politically charged year of 2015. But what are his biggest challenges? At the end of the day, it, it can't be as easy as he made it sound. 
Well, I don't think he did make it sound easy. I don't know how you can draw that conclusion. But I think one thing we need to get straight here is Mehdi Hassan is trying to make out that there is this huge divide between the Labour Party approach and the coalition approach. Actually, there isn't. The Labour Party's budget in March said that they would cut by 20% over four years, but they would delay the cuts for a year. The Conservatives and the coalition government have said they would cut by 19%. The only real difference is, just, is to be whether it's, yeah, is, is is whether it's one year, whether it's delayed for one year or two years. That's the only difference. It's a is, minute difference, this actually. This is the second... Ian, this is, this is Tory spin once again. You're not comparing like with like. No, you it's not compare. Tory spin. George Don't George accuse me of Tory spin spend. when you're is, quite prevalent at doing it yourself. That's what they've been briefing all day no, since it's the not. spending statement. That's the emails I'm getting. I haven't Look, been briefed, I haven't been briefed by compare. a single person Ian, today. OK, Vanessa Fair Rossi, enough. the okay. final question okay, for you. you. Listen, no, 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 I need to respond to that. Ian, 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 you comparing a spending review today... George Osborne's figures today with a March budget. Since then, Labour has a new leader and a new shadow yeah. chancellor with totally different <laughs> figures. In March, Alistair with Darling... With the same policies. The same policies. Tax on the bank. It's the yeah. same Sorry, policies. Sorry, in March, maybe, they were not... Maybe, maybe we have no, to focus not. on Johnson's some other people's agreed people's to the capital gains tax well. rise. Alan Johnson's agreed to a uh, £7.5 billion pound tax on the bank. Okay. So you're just Vanessa ignoring Rossi, that, Vanessa briefly, the last question is for you. If this plan goes ahead, just the way as it's been put forward, where will the UK be in 2014? Well, I would hope to be in a more financially secure place than we are currently. Uh, and that's, I think, quite critical. I would hope that growth, because the rest of the world as well will continue growing, will be reasonably good. Unfortunately, on the unemployment figures, it's quite hard to see a better case than unemployment sticking in the 7 to 8 percent range, even on a quite a optimistic reading. And I fear that if we took the more, more unpleasant readings, such as the PricewaterhouseCoopers figures, it could be that unemployment is actually a bit higher than that. And that's rather worrying, but I think that's a two-sided view. The one is the financial security, the other is the problem about jobs, and we will have to come back to looking at that once the financial security issue is put to bed. So Mehdi Hassan, is there a risk of having a, a social problem with all these people who might find themselves out of a job and not really being sure whether the uh, private sector will be able to absorb them? There That's is a huge going to be risk. what we'll see emerge in the next we, two years. The UK's opposition to these the, problems are about jobs. They're not about raising the retirement age to 62 as they are in France. Look, we've had a debate about whether we're going to recession or not, whether it's good for the economy, whether it balances the budget, which is all fine. My point is, even if, even if I were to buy the coalition's line that this will stabilise the economy, which I don't, the social costs could be so huge. You look at the Treasury's own tables, which are published today, which show that the poorest tenth percentage of the, po the poorest decile of the population will be second worst hit by these cuts. Uh, only the richest tenth will be worth it, but all the people in the middle will not. And you look at the social housing budget hit by 60% cuts. You'll see an increase in the number of homeless people, according to charities today, looking at the figures. You'll see more people on unemployment benefit, and you'll see actually less benefits to go around. A £7 billion squeeze on top of the £11 billion squeeze. This government has decided to squeeze as much money out of welfare in order to cut less other way. I really do think you'd have a much worse problem if the whole, gov whole government of the whole country went in, into a financial meltdown. I'm afraid that would be the reality. It would be even worse for these people. I think well, Ian, the idea that any, we're heading the any road risk of the, of the country Greece going into a financial me meltdown at this point? You can't rule out a double-dip recession. I don't think anybody does. None of us wants it. But uh, uh, Vanessa was right earlier in the conversation when she said that w we, we are obviously subject to some world pressures. But I think what George Osborne has done today has been to stabilise the economy, to has, give, has given the international money markets confidence in the British economy. Hopefully we'll be attracting a lot of new investment from overseas to start up the new businesses that we need to, to create the jobs that we have to create over the next few years. I agree with Mehdi Hassan to an extent that I think the Treasury forecasts are very optimistic in, in, in that measure. And, and I'm, not sort of, I'm not sitting here as a propagandist for the government. I think what they've done today is right, but that there are things that everyone would, would do slightly differently. There are cuts that I would have made much bigger than that have been made today in some areas and in others um, maybe, maybe smaller. But well, there was no alternative. I'm in this sorry whole to conversation, we, we haven't have heard from Mehdi any alternative show, strategy. So I really want to thank our guests, Ian Dale, Vanessa Rossi and Mehdi Hassan. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Goodbye for now. <laughs>